All right, so there are some brave souls that decided to come when I was preaching. <laughs> uh, you know, as I uh, was thinking about, as pastor asked me to preach tonight, and I got to thinking about just exactly what I'd speak on, and I had some ideas in my head, and um, over the last couple weeks, I had uh, several people approach me about a certain question, and uh, I decided that, you know, that is something that, you know, uh, I've had to study on, something that I've had to um, kind of look at from a biblical perspective. So tonight, uh, I'd like to speak to you about ammo. All right? Um, if you've ever been hunting, okay, it is always a good thing to have ammo. Um, I have, on occasion, forgot my ammo. That's still fun when you're watching deer run by and you have nothing to shoot at them. Uh, I remember rabbit hunting with my dad and I had a, a bolt action 410 and um, a rabbit's r running around and it cuts right out in front of me and I pull up to shoot the rabbit and click. Oh, I forgot to rack in the shell. Uh, so ammo is very important. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you about that. Uh, it's always a good thing to have ammo. Um, one time I was bow hunting, I'm in a tree stand 10 or 15 feet up in the air, and I got bored. Anybody been there, bow hunting? <laughs> uh, so I decided to pick out a target on the ground and shoot. I shot every arrow I had. Okay, is that a good idea? No. Luckily for me, there was not a deer running by or anything like that, so I didn't, but I thought after I did it, wow, that was stupid. If a deer runs by, I have no, no ammo. So I want to talk to you today about ammo. Now, ladies, don't tune out yet, okay? I know ammo is something that the guys like to talk a lot about, but don't tune out because I think this is beneficial for anybody, okay? Because we're going to talk about the ammo of the Word of God tonight. Uh, I've heard this book referred to as a 66 caliber, and let, let me tell you, it will do the job. It will do the job. Um, you know, we're getting, close to, um, we're getting close to Easter, towards Resurrection Sunday. And, you know, even back then, they messed around with things that happened. They made up lies. They told stories about what actually took place. But we know, based on the Word of God, exactly what happened. They said the disciples came and stole his body. That was a lie. They said that, oh, uh, something else happened. You know, that he really didn't die. He was just swooning. Uh, he just kind of fell asleep and was kind of in a, like, a state of just uh, unconsciousness. According to the Bible, it says that he died. And when he died on that cross, he paid for your sin and for my sin. And tonight I want to talk to you uh, about um, ammo and, and being ready. I like it when I know the answer. Somebody asked me a question. Uh, I like it. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to try and find somebody that does know the answer. And uh, so it's always nice to have the answer. And my goal tonight is for, to give each and every one of you ammo. For you younger kids, I want you to know that the Bible is the truth. And that you can turn to it anytime you want and find out what the truth is. Don't ever let go of that. Don't ever let go of the Bible. You're going to hear people of all ages tell you things. And you can judge by what they say by this book. You can. It is the truth. John chapter 17, verse 17, one of my favorite verses says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is the truth. And we can, we can bank on it. God says something, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So I want to talk to you tonight, tonight, or excuse me, tonight about ammo. Um, we need to have it. Without it, uh, we get in a battle, and we'll be in trouble if we don't have any ammo. Do you realize that we're in a battle? this evening? If you're saved and you're uh, a Christian here this evening, do you know that you're in a battle? Uh, you don't have to look very far into the, in what's going on in the world to know that there, there's a battle raging on. There's a battle raging on. And, you know, we need to equip ourselves with ammo, okay? The Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God, and then it starts to list all the armor, and he gives us a sword, which is a sword of the Spirit. And you realize that the sword is for offense. It's for offense. I, I tell people all the time, 
why, does it, why do we always have to go on the defensive? Why does, when people ask us questions, why do we always take a defensive posture? Why not turn it right around and, go, and repeat what they were saying or give them their exact same question back? Why can't we be on the offense? Isn't the word of God an offensive weapon? It's a sword, isn't it? And so I want to talk to you now, tonight about having ammo. And that ammo comes from this book right here. And I want to talk to you tonight about being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I want to talk to you tonight about putting on the whole armor of God and that you'll be able to stand, withstand, and to stand, and to stand therefore. As we look here, if you would, take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And this is where we put on the, the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to start reading verse number 10. Ephesians 6, verse number 10. But before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll get into the message. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that uh, tonight, Lord, that you'd uh, allow my words to be clear, Lord. I pray that it would not be confusing. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, work through your word this evening. And Lord, I pray that everything that's said and done would bring honor and glory to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number 10 of, uh, if he, excuse me, of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on, excuse me, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in, that, in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So God's given us some armor. The reason why you put on armor is because you're in a battle. Okay? There's somebody trying to wound you. There's somebody that's trying to attack you. And we need to be ready. We need to be ready for that. Uh, the Bible tells us to beware of the devil. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom we who may, who may devour. And we're to trust in the Lord and, and allow the Lord to work. And uh, we're to resist the devil. So we're going to get into this evening uh, about talking about ammo and the ammo of the word of God. Now, if, you, uh, if I was to give you a few shells to put in your rifle to go hunting... Would you be happy with just a couple shells? Or would you like it if I gave you a box of shells? Okay, if you've gone hunting at, at uh, any time in your life, there's times when you shoot at something and miss, okay? I remember my dad uh, shooting, and my dad was a very good shot, but he would shoot, and then he, he had a pump uh, shotgun, and he would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot until he was empty. Uh, I'm sure he was glad he had those extra rounds. And tonight, I want to give you some extra ammo. I want to give you some extra. You might not have heard this. You might, uh, this might be new to some of you. Some of you, it's, it might be stuff that you've heard before. But I'm going to talk about the ammo of, ammo of the Word of God tonight. When the devil tempted Jesus Christ, do you realize that he, he, uh, re, re, uh, he responded the way a man should respond? Now, what I mean by that, he could have said, listen, Satan, you know who I am. Why are you even messing with me? Do you know I could take care of you right now if I wanted to? But that's not how Jesus responded. So in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 4, uh, the Lord says to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the, the Lord, even dealing with the devil, goes right to the Bible. He, and then the devil tempts him in another way, and he says, it is written. And then he tempts him in another way, and he says, it is written. He's always referring to the Bible, always referring to, can I tell you, you can depend on the Bible tonight. You can depend on it. Listen, don't ever, don't ever let anybody steal your Bible. They're, they're out there trying to steal it. Don't let them. Don't let them. If I get an opportunity to talk to a new college student or somebody that's going off to college, and they ask me uh, what my opinion is or something like that, I will always tell them, don't let them steal your Bible. 
Unfortunately, there are schools out there that get you in class and then they tear down the Word of God. That's not how it ought to go. These, then these, these young people graduate and they start churches and guess what they're going to teach their church, their church people? How to tear down the Word of God. Can I tell you, and if you don't get anything else out of this this evening, uh, men, ladies, young people, uh, younger children, don't let somebody steal your Bible. <clears throat> so we're talking tonight about the ammo of the Word of God. I like reading Westerns. I like reading Westerns. And in the battle scenes, there might be fighting against other people, but one of the things I notice is they always, in the battle, even if they have to take a couple seconds, when they're, as, they're, as they're in this battle, they always, as soon as they can, start reloading. They always try to reload. And I found that fascinating, that even if they have a, just a, 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 a little bit of a break in the action, they're trying to get shells into their gun so that they uh, can be prepared. Even if they think the battle's over, the very first thing they do is start reaching for ammo, start thumbing shells into their gun. And I want you to be prepared tonight. I want, I want to maybe encourage you to uh, be able to fight the good fight. And so we're going to talk about that uh, tonight. I want to give you some ammo against false teachings. And this, like I said, this question's come up to me several times in the last few weeks. And, I, and it's not really have anything to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection as we're going to celebrate next week. But it just is something that's been brought to my attention, something that I've been thinking a lot about. So I want to share it with you tonight. And what I want to talk about is people that want to try to teach that it's okay to talk in tongues. That it's okay to go to a healing service. I want to give you some ammo for that. Okay? It's really, it's really very simple. It's really, really very, very simple. If you would, I want you to take your Bibles real quickly and go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> And we're going to look at verse number 16, or excuse me, first, verse 15. Second, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. One of the things you're going to find about sometimes as you grow up, you young people as you grow up, there's people that like to twist the word of God. Like to twist the word of God. I, it's an interesting term here. It's, it talks about resting. Okay? It's W-R-E-S-T. Okay? Now I know there's a few people in here that have uh, wrestled. Okay? And you, uh, you've, you've uh, been on a wrestling team, and you're grappling with somebody. You're trying to get points. You're trying to score. That's what's happening here. There's people resting the word of God. They're, they're grappling with it. They're trying to twist it to fit their belief system. Can I tell you, if you're, you're here tonight, and you're trying to make the Bible match your belief system, you're dead wrong. It's not our job. It is not our job to change the Bible to match our belief system. If there's something wrong, we change our belief system and have it match the Word of God. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. So you can trust this book here. You can trust this book. I want to share some of the things that I've learned about this. I've actually, I actually learned about this quite some time ago. I uh, actually ran into a young man at work who was a college student, and I'll tell you his story in just a little bit. But there's a bunch of false teaching out there about tongues, about healings, Things like that. And I hope tonight, you've probably got already some ammo, but I want to give you some more. And it's, it's really quite simple. So, where would they go if they're going to teach you about tongues? They'd take you to Acts chapter 2. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is one of the places that somebody who's going to talk to you about tongues is going to go. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
Then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue wherein we were born? And then it lists all these different places that these people were from. Um, look down to verse number 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? So here you have a miracle that is taking place, okay? The, the Galileans are preaching, and everybody hears it in their own language. I don't know if you noticed it, but it says that there are uh, Jews there from every nation, from every nation. Uh, they came from everywhere, and everybody heard it in their own language. Everybody heard it in their own tongue. That's what um, tongues were, were all about in Acts ch chapter 2. I want to also uh, help you to notice that um, tongues is not, I will repeat this, tongues is not the first sign of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have heard that before? It's not. Let's look at what the Bible says. Okay, and when they, uh, the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. The first sign of the Holy Ghost coming is the sound of a mighty rushing wind. That's the first sign of the, of the, the Holy Spirit. So, if you have somebody that says that tongues are the first sign, you can take them to Acts chapter 2 and say, you need to hear the wind first. The sound of a mighty rushing wind. You say, Brother John, how in the world can a, the sound of a wind have something to do with the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is the story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night, asking him, uh, about, uh, he says, uh, we know that thou art a master, a rabbi come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest, uh, lest God be with him. And uh, the Lord says unto him, um, that in verse number three, he says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus goes like, what? And he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How is this going to happen? I'm a grown man. How am I going to get born again? So the Lord tries to give him a little more information. Okay? He says in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight, this is another verse that they use. This is another verse that they use. Because they associate the Holy Spirit with water baptism. They associate the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit with water baptism. Now, you, would you read with me? Just look as I read, and you tell me if baptism is mentioned in this portion of Scripture. Okay, Jesus answered, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the king, into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must... Be born again. Do you see baptism in there anywhere? But there's water. But there's water. It's got to mean baptism, right? No. It's not in there. That's not what it's talking about. In fact, the Lord explains it. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's talking about a natural birth, and it's talking about a spiritual birth. So people like to pull ver verses out. They like to twist them. I actually sat with a, a man, and he asked me to do a Bible study, study with him. And we went to John chapter 3. 
And he read through John 3, 1 through uh, 5, and he said, see, right there, you need to be baptized. And I said, I didn't see anything about baptism there. Boy, how people like to rest the scriptures, don't they? They like to rest them. So if you have somebody, they might turn you to John chapter 3 and verse number 5. But you know what's interesting? You ask, you, I, I asked you guys, what does the sound of wind have to do with the Holy Spirit? We talked about two births here, right? One's a physical birth. The water birth is a physical. Then you have a spiritual birth. I want you to look at verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. And I want you to remember what we just read in Acts chapter 2. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So it's talking about wind, isn't it? You can hear wind. Has anybody ever seen wind? You've seen the effects of wind, but have you seen wind? I had a man at work tell me, he says, I'm not going to believe anything unless I see it. And I said this very thing. I said, how do you feel about wind? And he goes, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> I, I said, yep. So you have the wind blowing. You can tell it's blowing because you can hear it. But do you notice the very end of that verse, what it says? So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Do you understand that the Spirit gives you life? When God created man in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth, formed his body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man is a triune being. He's got a body, he has a soul, he has a spirit. And when God gave him life, the spirit is what gave him life. How many of you have ever heard the story of the dry bones in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37? Remember the dry bones? Remember that story? For the sake of time, I won't read through the whole thing. I'll just kind of give you a quick thing. But uh, there's dry bones in this valley. And the Lord starts to bring the bones together. And he starts to put sinew back in there. He starts to put flesh back on there. But they're not alive. He starts to give them everything they need except for life. So what does he do? What does he say? In Ezekiel chapter 36, you know what he says? He calls the wind. And the wind blows and it gives them breath. It gives them breath. And so we see that throughout scripture, the Holy Spirit is associated with wind. It's associated with breath. So those that want to say, how can you say that the Holy Spirit, the sound of a uh, rushing mighty wind has to do with the Holy Spirit? Can I tell you that's exactly what it's talking about? Okay, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Okay, they have that in them. So you have in Acts chapter 2, you have uh, people speaking in tongues. You have the, the disciples speaking in tongues. Everybody, everybody's hearing it in their own language. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And they are all amazed and they're going, what does this mean? And then, of course, Peter stands up and goes through uh, all that he has to say at Pentecost. So we're talking tonight about uh, tongues. Now I want to show you something tonight that I learned several years ago, and it's been a great help for me. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you will learn these two verses that I'm going to talk to you about, It'll be a great help to you in dealing with this issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want you to go down to verse number 22. 1 Corinthians 14, I want you to go down to verse number 22. It says, wherefore, tongues are for a what? A sign. Okay, tongues were for a sign. What's a sign for? What's the purpose of a sign? When you go down the road, there's signs all along the road. What's the purpose? It's to help you, right? It's to get you to understand what, what's going on on the road. Uh, there's a speed limit. There might be a do not pass sign. There might be uh, slower traffic move to the right, whatever it might be, but the signs are there to help you, okay? Tongues are a sign. 
Now you say, Brother John, what does that have to do with anything? I'm going to get to that. But I want you to realize when people talk about tongues, that it is a sign. I want you to see what the rest of that verse says, okay? Because it's very, very important. The rest of that verse, uh, verse 22, says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. Did you get that? It's not to them that believe. But to them, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So here we have uh, Paul talking about uh, tongues being a sign. It's for unbelievers. The whole reason why God gave this, uh, this, or allowed this thing to happen in Acts chapter 2 was so that unbelieving people would, would realize that uh, God was working and that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So this sign was used to reach unbelieving people. Now, this next verse I'm going to show you is going to kind of tie this together. It's, all, it's also in 1 Corinthians, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to go to verse number 22. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22. And we'll read what the Bible has to say about a sign. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, for the, what does it say? The Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. You see, we as Gentiles, we love education. We love to learn. That's our focus. But you know, for a Jew, they like to see it. They like to see it. You know, the, the, the Pharisees came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 and said, we, we, we desire of thee a sign. We want to see a sign. You know what the Lord said to them? An evil and adulterous generation looks for a sign. But you know what he did? He gave them a sign. He gave them a sign. He said, as the prophet Jonas was three days and three nights in the, in the heart, or excuse me, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He still gave them a sign. Even though he called them an evil and adulterous generation. So the Jew requires a sign. So if tongues are for a sign and the Jew requires a sign, I want to know why there's a bunch of Gentiles running around out here talking in tongues. You ever think about that? Why are there a bunch of Jewish people, or excuse me, Gentiles, out there talking about speaking in tongues? See, it's, it has nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with them. I'll go back to that young man. He was a college student. And he worked across the line from me. And uh, I, we got to talking about speaking in tongues. And I said, are you Jewish? Now, this young man was a full-blooded Indian, and I mean from India. Okay? And we were talking. He grew up in America. His parents had uh, immigrated from India over here. And I asked him, I said, are you Jewish? I knew he wasn't Jewish. But I was going to make a point. I said, are you Jewish? And he goes, no, why? I said, well, what are you doing messing around with tongues which are designed to reach unbelieving Jews? And he goes, I'm going to have to talk to my mom about this. <laughs> and he did. His mom worked in the shop up towards the front. So the very next day, I was all excited because I was hoping uh, I'd be able to talk to him some more. So I waited, he worked across, right across the line from me again. I said, uh, I finally, I, I probably waited about a half an hour, <laughs> but I'm sure I was like, oh, excited. Um, and I said, so what did your mom say? He, he said, my mom said not to talk to you anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all the fun. <laughs> Can I tell you when you, you take this book and you have the, some ammo behind it, that's what you'll get. My mom said not to talk to you anymore. That's what you'll get. Tongues are for a sign. The Jew requires a sign. They're for an unbelieving Jew. Did you realize, do you know, I don't know if you know this, but the nation of Israel was started on signs. We can go back to Exodus chapter 4. And what's the first thing that God tells Moses to do? What does he give him? He gives him two signs. He says, stick your hand in your vest. Pull it out. What is it? 
Leprous, put it back in and pull it out. What is it? It's clean. Throw your rod on the ground. What is it? Pick it back up. What is it? That nation was started on signs. Now, I'm going to show you something this evening that some of you might not know. That there's, there's things that God gave to the Jewish people. And again, we have a lot of people that think um, that they should follow in that um, same thing. So, um, how many have ever heard of the Sabbath? Ever heard of the Sabbath? How many have ever heard Sunday called the Sabbath? You're going to learn something tonight. Because the Bible says that actually the Sabbath was assigned to Israel. The Sabbath was a sign between God and the nation of Israel. So I don't know why we have a bunch of people running around there and talking about the Sabbath. That's the problem I have with the Seventh-day Adventists. Why are they doing something that was designed for a Jew? It was a sign to them. The Jew requires a sign. If you'll learn this thought, if you'll get, if you'll learn 1 Corinthians 14, 22, and you'll learn 1 Corinthians 1, 22, it'll save you a whole bunch of arguing. Because uh, the Sabbath is a sign. Look in the Old Testament. Um, in fact, we might as well look there. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, because I want you to see this. Ooh, time's going. Ezekiel chapter 20, I want you to look down at verse number 12. This is the Lord talking to Israel. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse number 12, it says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. Jump over to verse number 15. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, uh, which is the glory of all the lands. Okay? So the Lord gave that as a sign. Verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So my question is, why do we have a bunch of people running around celebrating the Sabbath when it's a sign? It's a Jewish sign. The next thing I'd uh, like to talk to you about, as far as, um, sorry about that, uh, is the, this thing about healing. I think one of the saddest things that ever occurs is some guy telling somebody that he can heal them. There's not a dirtier crook on the face of this planet that'll get somebody's hopes up only to find out he can't do it. And then he'll blame it on you for not having enough faith. There's not a, a dirtier crook on the face of this earth, people like that. So we're going to talk about healing. Is, is it real? Can, are there really faith healers out there? So I want to talk to you about that this evening. <clears throat> Did the Lord heal people? Were the disciples able to heal people? How about uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul? Was he able to heal people? Yeah. He did. He did all of those things. But the nation of Israel, again, was right there. And in fact, if you look in the Old Testament, you're, you're going to see that God told the nation of Israel that he would heal them. That he will, do you realize there's coming a day when he's going to heal Israel? It's in the future, but he's going to heal them. He wants to heal Israel. They just haven't responded. So healing. It is something that Jesus did. It is something that the Jewish people did. Or excuse me, the Jewish uh, apostles and disciples. It is something that the apostle Paul. Do you know how you can tell if a person was a true apostle? How could you tell somebody that was a true apostle? You take them and judge it by the Bible. So why don't you go to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12.
and look at verse number 12. How many have ever had them, somebody tell you that they are, are an apostle? Or they have apostolic succession? I've had, I've had people say that to me, okay? And I won't tell you my response. I'm going to read it to you, okay? 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle, what was that again? The what? The signs of an apostle were wrought among you all in patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. You know how you could tell that somebody was an apostle? They could perform all those miracles. So I'm talking to a man at work. He said he's apostolic. I said, that's very interesting. So you have all the sign gifts then, right? And he goes, yes. And I said, you and I, are, after work, we're going we're gonna to take a little trip. I'll get back to that in a minute. <clears throat> so I want you to think about what the Lord Jesus Christ did as far as miracles. I want you to think about what the apostles did. I want you to think about what the apostle Paul did <clears throat> in, uh, in, in healing in these miracles that were performed. Do you see, because they're out there teaching that they have that ability. They will take you, they will take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where you have the gifts of the Spirit, and one of the gifts is healing. One of the gifts is healing. And then they'll run you to another verse, and I want you to look at this verse. I want you to go to John chapter 14. And they will use this verse also, John chapter 14. They'll take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and they'll tell you that there are gifts of healing. Then they'll take you to John chapter 14, in verse number 12, John 14, 12. And this is the Lord Jesus talking. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall, ye, shall, shall he do, because I go to my Father. And, and he'll point to that and say, See, we're going to do the works that Jesus Christ did. Well, that's really, really interesting to me, because I decided to look up what Jesus did. Do you re realize that Jesus, and it won't take, for the sake of time, we're not going to go through everything, but do you realize, and I've got verses upon verses upon verses, that, that Jesus Christ never went to a funeral. Never. Everybody that he came across that was dead, he, he brought them back to life. Never went to a funeral. Heal the sick, heal the lame, the blind to see, the, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak. I mean, cast out devils. He did it all. I want you to see something. He also gave the disciples the same kind of thing. Uh, this is a familiar passage to everybody. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. You guys are going to recognize this. He gave the disciples the same thing. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. He said, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, usually that's where everybody stops. I like to read on after that. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall not be damned. And these, what's the next word? Signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Uh, shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing... Uh, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So you have the apostolic, excuse me, the apostolic signs, do you? Well, you and I need to take a trip. There's a hospital right down the road. If you got the gifts, you have the signs, right? You have that apostolic succession. Well, listen, there's a cemetery right down the road. You ought to bring a couple of them up, shouldn't you? Do you see, see what, what's going on here? Do you see what they're doing? They claim to have the signs, but they don't have them. Do you realize that the only sign they claim to have is, is speaking in tongues? And then when you go to a service where they're healing somebody, it's, it's nothing but a big fake. There's people that go there hoping 
praying, and with every ounce of faith that they have, believe that they can get healed, and then it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So they have all the signs, do they? I don't think they do. It was given to the disciples. It was given to the Apostle Paul. He did many signs. You know what, these, you know what they were able to do? They were able to do the same thing. They were able to bring people back to life. You ever read about Paul bringing something back to life? Does anybody remember the name Eutychus? Fell out of a window? Does anybody remember Peter bringing somebody back to life? Wasn't there a young girl that Peter brought back to life? Listen, these guys had the signs. Who requires a sign? Why do we have a bunch of Gentiles messing around with stuff designed for unbelieving Jews? So you know it's a farce. You know it's all made up. You know the saddest thing about this whole thing is they'll ask you to give money. And they say, they'll tell you, they won't say it in these words, but your chances are better if you give. That's sad. That's sad. And they have no problem taking their money. There's people that give up life savings to stuff like that. And we'll get into what the Bible talks about them. Okay? Now, why would you say that tongues are gone, signs are gone? Is there any biblical proof of that? I'm glad you asked. Okay? So the Apostle Paul was able to raise the dead, heal the sick. Uh, make the blind to see, all those things that everybody, all the other apostles and Jesus Christ had. I want to show you two portions of scripture, one in 1 Timothy, one in 2 Timothy. And you remember the, Paul, the apostle Paul, I didn't get into this, but you remember where he's on the Isle of Miletus, I think it is, and he's got some brush, and he's going to throw it on the fire, and a viper comes out and gets him, and he just shakes it off, and nothing happens. That's the signs of an apostle. That's the signs of an apostle. First Timothy. I'll show you this and we're just about done. First Timothy. And we're going to go to chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. Now this is Paul. He's writing to Timothy. He's got all the apostolic signs. He's got the signs of an apostle. He can do it all. I want you to uh, um, go down to verse number 23 as he's talking to Timothy. He says to Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Well, Paul, if you have the apostolic sign and you can heal somebody that's sick, why don't you just heal him? Can I tell you why? Because God was done with the apostolic signs. Even at the end of the apostle Paul's ministry, he can't even heal Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll show you another one. Look at verse number 20. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 20. Paul is, is talking about people. He says, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I let, uh, left at my leadum. And how does he leave him? He's sick. I thought you could heal the sick. I thought you could give the sight to the blind. I thought you could raise the dead. You can't even help this guy. Do you know why? Because God was dealing, no longer starting to deal with the Jewish people. Do you realize that when Jesus Christ went to trial, that the Pharisees said, when Pilate said, behold your king, they said, we have no king but Caesar. And Pilate goes and washes his hands. He said, I, I, I'm washing my hands of this whole thing. His blood will not be upon my hands. Do you know what the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders said? Let his blood be upon us and our children. And can I tell you, from that point on, that's exactly what the Jewish people have suffered. Exactly. You don't have to go back not even 100 years to watch what happens to the Jewish people. Do you know why that happened? It's because they rejected their Messiah. They rejected their Messiah. So the gifts are gone. The gifts are, are gone with, with the apostles. So what does the Bible have to say about those that claim to have these gifts? 
Would you be interested to find out? I was interested. How does God feel about this? I want you to take your Bibles. There's two verses. The first one is in Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. And we're going to look at verse number 14. Proverbs 25, verse number 14. And it says, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like wind and clouds without rain. In other words, they're nothing. They're nothing. They're good for nothing. They just blow around. They just spread around a bunch of hot air is all they really do. If somebody tells you they have the gifts, hey, listen, let's go on the offense and say, show me. Show me. Say, let's go down to the hospital. Do you realize how much money they could make if they really had the gifts? They could go down to the hospital and start healing people. They would be flooded with invitations from every place on this earth. Do you think they'd have to worry about money? Nope. Why are they wasting their time at some tent meeting healing 20 or 30 people if they have the gifts? Let's go. Let's go. Man, it won't be long. You can pay for your own jet and you can fly all over the world. They're like wind and clouds without rain. They just blow around and accomplish absolutely nothing. That's what the Bible says about it. But it doesn't stop there. We have one more verse. Take your Bibles, go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 1. Revelation 2, verse number 1. Unto the angel of the church of uh, Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. And has found them to be what? Liars. And that's exactly what they are. They're liars. You know what I found out? People don't like to be called a liar. Even if they lied, they still don't like it. They don't like it. So don't be afraid, based on Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, to say to somebody that says they have the apostolic gifts and you offer to take them to the to the cemetery or to the hospital, and they say, no, you have every right to call them a liar. Every right. They're the ones that, cl that are, they're claiming they have the gifts, only they're claiming it falsely. <clears throat> I don't know if you ever thought about this, but they'll try to pin on the person that they don't have enough faith. I don't have time tonight, but I can show you verse after verse after verse in the Bible of people that had no faith at all and God healed them. He even healed people that didn't even believe in him, and he healed them. So if they tell you that faith is needed, yeah, sometimes God would say, thy faith had made thee whole, but not always. Not always was faith something that was needed. Can God heal a person? Absolutely. Absolutely. He just doesn't do it that way anymore. He just doesn't do, that, do it that way anymore. Again, it's designed, it's a sign, it's for Jewish people. It's to reach unbelieving Jews. Uh, I was talking to a young man just recently about this. He says, well, why doesn't God keep doing it for the Jewish people? I said, because he, he stopped with the Jew. He's not done with them, but he stopped. Now a Jew has to get saved exactly as you and I have to get saved. Now, will that pick up again? Absolutely, God is going to deal with the Jewish people again. He's absolutely going to do it. Do you think he'll maybe do some signs and wonders? Do you think there's some signs and wonders that are going to be coming? Anybody know of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11? Any signs there? You better believe it. You better believe it. 
But for today, listen, that stuff just doesn't fly. They're false. They're false apostles. They're liars. Anybody that will get up there and tell somebody and give somebody hope that they can be healed from their infirmity and then doesn't do it are liars. God can heal you if that be his will. Again, I want you to have ammo. Maybe you have family members that are wrapped up in this. Maybe you have friends. I'm not saying you have to be mean. I'm not saying you have to be rough. But there's nothing wrong with you giving them the Bible. There's nothing wrong. Listen, let me ask you a question tonight. What is the final authority for everything you believe in? Is it going to be Pastor Henry? Is he the final authority? Is it going to be one of our deacons? Are they going to be the final authority? How about Mr. Yeomans? Is he going to be the final authority? Can I tell you? Absolutely not. You take this book right here and make that your final authority. My desire tonight was to give you some ammo. My desire tonight was to give you some things in the Bible that will help you and help you to know the truth. To know the truth. There's a lot of falsehood out there. There's a lot of false teaching. But can I tell you, with some study, with a little, maybe a concordance, you can find a lot of things in the Bible that you might not have seen before. And I hope that these things that I mentioned tonight will be a help to you. If you didn't get it all, I, I, I think it's recorded, Brother Ron. And if not, I can, I can supply... Uh, some verses and stuff, but I, my desire is that you get this and that you use it and be ready for the attack because it will come. It will come. And you, so you just think about that and the signs. Anytime, anytime you start getting into that stuff, you're going to run them right back to 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Corinthians 1 and ask them if they're Jewish and why they're doing that. So tonight, I want you to think on these things. I want you to take the Bible for what it says and stand on it. We put on the whole armor of God. What did, what did, why did God give us all that armor? Do you realize that he said so that we will stand? We will stand. We don't want to be somebody that's blown about by every wind of doctrine. You know, what, you know why God gave us the Bible? He gave us the Bible because all scripture is given by inspiration. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what it's good for. Listen, you can judge everything by this book. I know people like to go to uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not lest ye be judged. Can I tell you, you can judge everything by this book right here. You can say, it's not me, it's the book. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of fun. You know, that's between you and God. I'm showing it to you. You know, it's just the Bible. And that's a lot of fun. And I hope tonight and encourage you, not only you younger kids and teenagers, listen, you, you realize that this, this book is true. You realize that everything in there, every word in there is exactly what God wanted us to have. And we can know that it is the truth. And I pray that you guys going forward, and for me also, that we would stand. Because I'm afraid the day's coming when we're going to face more than what we're facing right now. And we have to be ready to stand. 